This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Chris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, Jen. Hey, Kim. How are you? What's up, girl? What's up? What's up? How are you? We, I'm doing great. We have the very first, first, first episode. First. Episode, of episode, episode, episode. Of, the of, sec- of. Go ahead. You know, it's, I'm reverberating. <laughs> it's, it's a bigger announcement you that way. You don't have to because our equipment already does that for us. <laughs> I know. I thought maybe people wouldn't notice. Okay, yeah, go um, ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. We have today our very first episode of the second annual 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. So if your holidays aren't stressful enough, here comes Jen and Cam to bring you uh, some more dreadful stories. The 12 Days Before Your Holiday Stress kicks into full year. Gotta love it. And if you were listened last year, you know that we feature a case the 12 days prior to kicking off the holiday extravaganza. And each day we feature a corresponding case with the number of victims. So for instance, today is my case. I have the first one and there's one victim. Okay. So tomorrow's Jen's case and she has two victims and so on and so on. Right. And so on, so on, so forth. Yep. I just thought I'd throw that out there in case they didn't listen last year. And let me say, if you haven't, go back and take a listen. You'll enjoy it, I promise. Or I think. Or Yeah. Yeah. So you have the very first episode? I do. You ready? You're taking uh, odd numbers. I'm taking even numbers this year, correct? Yep. We switched. Last year I had even, and you were odd, as you still are. And this year Mm -hmm. I'm odd, and you're even. This one, Jen, is, it's really terrible. I mean, horrible. In fact, when I was trying to figure out what case to do, I was like, you know, sadly, it's a good testament to the world. There's so many murders that happen, like one single murder. So I decided to Google worst murder ever. And this one popped up. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, there you go. So here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's hear the worst murder ever per Google. Gurg- hey, the gurgles. Well, people are crazy. Right. I mean, tell, they, tell if you ever want to realize how insane people are, do a true crime podcast with your best mm-hmm. friend. It's terrible. Yep. Here so we go, Jen. Friend, you ready? That's a different part. Uh huh. James Smith was an unemployed divorcee living in the Gordon area of Manchester. Now, this is in England, as you may have guessed, not Manchester. I'm sure there's a Manchester here, but this is in England. His friends would describe him as a very stringent kind of guy. He was a non-smoker who never drank alcohol. He was married, but in 1980, after 10 years of marriage, his wife left him. And she claimed this was due to the abuse that she had suffered by his hand. and. To say that it only gets worse is Mm. really, it's awful. In 1980, he met a 20-year-old girl named Tina Watson, and the two immediately started dating, and just like the others before her, he beat her, and he continued to beat her, even while she was pregnant. She got pregnant with his baby, and he even attempted, and this would come out later, he even attempted to drown her when she was bathing. The couple would date for two years, but finally... After that two-year time, Watson made a break for it, and she left, and she survived because of it. Watson would later say, At first, it was now and again just a little tap, but in the end, it was every day. He would smack me in the face, 
or hit me over the head with an ashtray. He would kick me in the legs or between the legs. It's disgusting. So in 1982, Smith meets a 15-year-old named Wendy Motorshead. The two begin a relationship immediately. And sadly, just like his wife, he violently abused this girl too. In one attack, he held her head under water in the kitchen sink in an attempt to drown her. Thankfully, she Uh, made it out. Thankfully. These three women survived, and they were able to talk about it and move past their bad choice in a relationship, shall we say. Now, this is much unlike the person we're going to talk about, and her name is Kelly Ann Bates. In 1993, Kelly Ann Bates was just an English teenager, a British teenager. She was 14 years old, and she was asked to go babysit some friends, some friends' kids of hers. When she was babysitting, she would meet a man that had stopped by the house named James Smith. Now, this is the James Smith that we talked about earlier that had an abuse problem with the women in his life. Here's the thing, Jen. James is 46 years old. He is 32 years older than Kellyanne. And he sets his sights on her, and he immediately begins grooming her. You know, very much just like a child molester, right? Because he is. I mean, she's he's 46, she's 14. He's a rapist. He's a rapist. Yes. That's, yeah. Well, and a murderer, but we learned that in a minute. Well, yeah. Kellyanne is young and naive. She had no idea about his previous abusive relationships. And, you know, at age 14, you don't even really, I'm not even so sure that you realize those exist. In your perfect world with your parents are still married, you know. I'm not even sure she understood that that is a thing. So, right. Because she did know that he was older, she worked really hard to keep the relationship a secret from her parents. Tommy and Margaret Bates, whom she knew would not be very happy, managed to keep this relationship a secret for a long time, approximately two years. After those years had passed and Kellyanne finished high school, She's now 17 years old, and she decides to make the relationship known. When Margaret and Tommy Bates realized their teen daughter had been in a secret relationship for two years, they demanded to meet James Smith, and they decided to pay him a visit to his apartment or his his house, his, what do they call it over there? I forget. What do you call it? Not a suite mate. I'm going to think about it in a minute. The Bates go over to his house. They're invited in. Kellyanne happens to be at the house at the time, and they notice she appeared nervous, and she sat quietly with her head down, almost like she knew she couldn't really say anything during her parents' visit. Now, Margaret Bates would later say that, and this just, like, put a hole in my heart, especially as a parent, her mom, Margaret, would state later that Smith had shown her a hole in the floor, and he had claimed that there was a gas leak in the hole, and that they had come and cut out a hole, and they were That's why it was a giant hole right there that they were fixing the gas leak. But it was Mm -hmm. later determined that that hole was where he was keeping her. He would actually put Kelly Ann in that hole. She was living in a hole in the floor. Like a little spider hole. Like Saddam Hussein was in. Yeah, that's... Yes. uh, Terrible. Very. After the parents met James for the first time, Kelly Ann decides to move into his house in November of 1995. And, you know, she's only 17 years old at this time, but in England, you can legally decide to move in with somebody. In the eyes of the law, you are a consenting adult and you're able to do that. In other words, the parents couldn't go and say, hey, we want her back, right? So they just kind of, you know, they're just hoping for the best. I would so not be happy. Mm. Oh, no, not at all. The relationship was rocky at best, and Kellyanne had left James a few times, but would always return to him. Now, hauntingly, later, her mother would recall seeing Kelly for the first time after the two had started living together, and she said, and this is scary, and you know, as parents, we we get that feeling, right? Like, you just, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Margaret Bates said, as soon as I saw Smith, the hairs on the back of my neck went up. I tried everything I could to get Kellyanne away from him. Now, I mean, as a parent, knowing what happens later, that has to be heartbroken. Just, I I can't even, right? 
More and more frequently, the Bates would notice bruises on Kellyanne, but Kellyanne would always have an excuse, such as, I fell, or it was just an accident. In fact, one time she claimed that a gang of girls attacked her after school, and that was to explain away a black eye that she had received. Now, Kellyanne also maintained that the bite marks happened on her body by accident. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sadly. How do you get bite marks by accident? Human bite marks. Mm Mm-hmm. Just like a lot of domestic abuse victims, Kellyanne never would reveal any of the abuse to her mother or father or friends or family. Oh, just wait, Jen, you're going to get all fired up. I know. You would. It makes me, it's, it really it's awful. makes me so sad that people keep that to themselves and they don't want, I, I don't, think they're you know. embarrassed, you know, like they, I don't know that they think. They don't well, want to be whole, judged, maybe. They don't want to be judged. I think that they think, well, he really loves me. That's why he's hitting me because. He said that he thought I'd cheat on him, and he doesn't understand. But he oh, said he's, he said he's going to change. And he said you he's know. sorry. He didn't mean it. If I just didn't make him mad, he wouldn't have had to do that. Yeah. It's just, and that makes me. Yeah. In December 1995, Kellyanne was becoming more and more withdrawn from family and friends, and she even resigned from her part-time job. Ooh, writing's on the wall there. In March 1996, so this is like four months later, Her parents received birthday cards, and they were supposed to be from Kelly Ann. It was for an anniversary and a birthday, but it was actually Smith who had written in them. It wasn't in her handwriting or her wording. Kelly Ann's parents said that they talked to their daughter on the phone, but after from that time that she moved in with him, that they would never actually see her in person, okay? Mm -hmm. At one point during... The short amount of time that they lived together, Tommy and Margaret, they had come together. They planned to confront Kellyanne. They were going to go to the Smith house and try to get her to, you know, come back home with them, make her realize it's not a healthy relationship and such. But a family member had contacted them and they said that they had reportedly talked to Kellyanne and she was fine. (laughs) In a month, I know, in a month before her death, Kellyanne's brother went to the house and tried to see her. Smith said that she wasn't at home. So he went to a neighbor and the neighbor said, you know what, let me go talk to him or whatever. Neighbor went and talked to him and she was told. Now, this is me putting the words there because this is what happened. Mm -hmm. She was briefly shown in an upstairs window. So I'm sure that James said, hey, get in the window and make sure that they see you. Like, she couldn't come to the door and talk to them, mind you. She just had to be, you know, show her, do some FaceTime in the window. Gotcha. So it was kind of like a proof of life, but she was yes. in the window. Got you. Okay. Now, if you're sibling, let's talk about that, Jen. If I'm no. like, I need to talk, I need to talk to Jen. And let's say Steve, your husband, it's like, she's fine. And then go, Jen, go to the window. First of all, <laughs> I know that would never happen because you would break the window out to be like, oh, hell no. But. Oh, Yeah. If I, the first thing I'd, uh, the police, I don't even think, I wouldn't want to come in the house. I wouldn't want to talk to them. I wouldn't want to even mess with that. I would go straight no. to the police. Right. No, I, there'd be something wrong that if I couldn't speak to you face to face, there's a problem. The, it's almost worse to have you come to the window, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, when Melissa Etheridge was singing, come to my window, it was not about this. I guarantee it. No. That was my bad singing joke. Uh, That was a bad joke, yeah. I was just pretending it didn't happen to save us all the embarrassment. Margaret Bates was so concerned at this point about how Kellyanne was being abused and treated, she called police, and they put her into contact with the Domestic Violence Department. Now, that department encouraged her to give Kellyanne information, such as leaflets and pamphlets, about how to identify abuse and leave the situation immediately. Sadly, Margaret never got the chance to deliver those to Kellyanne. Okay, if he hits you, that's abuse. You don't need a pamphlet telling you that that's... I think a lot of times, especially when you're younger, you got to remember how young she is. This was probably Mm the... Well, I guarantee it's the one and only boyfriend she's ever had. She started dating him so young. And her parents were still married. I don't know happily, but they. I think they still stuck through all of this and are still married. So to that is a testament to me. And so she didn't, I, I mean, there's so much to it and seeing what is abuse and recognizing it and the little things like how it all starts with a little bit of control that a little mm-hmm. bit more than it, you know what I mean? And then, yep. yeah. On April 16th, 1996, 
the abuse would finally end for Kelly and Bates. James Smith went to the local police station and told them his girlfriend had accidentally drowned in the bathtub Mm. and that her injuries were self-inflicted. Oh, okay. You don't Mm. like the bites? I don't believe it. (laughs) Shocking. He would later admit that he did kill her, but it was by accident, Jen. He said that he had tried to, you know, help her. And when he was trying to help her, there was an accident and it happened and he was resuscitating her. And in doing so, she had inhaled water. And Hmm. by inhaling that water, it caused her to drown and then subsequently die. Oh, and he also claimed that she pretended to be unconscious a lot of the time. So he thought she was just doing that now. Oh, poor well, thing. Yeah. And think after I finished this, I was like, well, the poor thing was probably hoping if she ever did that, she was hoping to, to play dead and that he'd leave her alone. Right. Right. You would or think he's so. Just a big, fat, dirty liar. I think he's other. a big, fat, dirty liar. When the authorities arrived, they found Kellyanne's naked body in a bedroom and her blood smeared on the floor and the walls in every room in the house. Despite the overwhelming evidence of torture. Smith still maintained it was an accident. Hmm, She did it all herself. Mm -hmm. Self-inflicted wounds, don't you know? After finding out that Smith had murdered her young daughter, Margaret Bates spoke out about Smith. She knew that her daughter had been involved with the man, but Kellyanne lied to her about several facts, including Smith's age and his first name. She told her mother and father that Smith's first name was Dave, not James or Jim, and that he was only 32 years old instead of the 48 years of age oh, that he was no. at this time. Are you 32 kidding was me? still too old for that. The family was left with more than a few questions. I would An autopsy. Think so. An autopsy would provide the answers to what happened to Kellyanne and to say it was far more depraved and gruesome than anyone could have imagined is a giant understatement. Pathologist William Lawler, who examined her body, said, In my career, I've examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I have never come across injuries so extensive. Detective Sergeant Joseph Moynihan of Greater Manchester Police added, I've been in the police force for 15 years, and I've never seen a case as horrific as this. That poor baby. So, Jen, we're gonna get we're gonna get into some specifics. So, if you don't want to hear this, and I debated about putting this in, is it that bad? It's, it's very graphic, but I almost think it's you just can't believe people do this. So, we're gonna get to that. My first little part, I left it out and just said. She suffered all these things, and then I went and added them in. Not all of them. I left a couple out because this was bad enough. You know what I mean? Lawler found in the examination that Kellyanne was actually being starved and had not been given water for several days before her death, causing her to lose. You ready? Now, remember, she moved in with him at the end of that year and was killed at the pretty much the beginning of the next year, right? I mean, just a Mm -hmm. couple months in. How do you, she had 14, how do you move in with a 34 Well, she wasn't man? 14 then. She was 17, right? Because she oh, kept it a secret okay. for two years. It's true. But she's only 17. She died at 17, okay? I know, but still. She's still a child to me, anyway. 17 that, is still a child. Are you, I still consider 25 a child. Let's be honest. Oh, uh, true. I mean, I, you know? Mm-hmm. People are more immature than they used to be, because they can be. It was determined that she had lost 20 is it, it, it's kg, is that kilograms? Kilograms. Satan, sorry. So she had lost 20 kilograms. And I was like, oh, what's that? Like 20 pounds? I look it up. 44 pounds. She lost 40. That's how much he was starving her. 44 pounds. Kellyanne's eyes had been removed and it was determined that they were removed. And this is a quote, Mm -hmm. not less than five days and not more than three weeks before her death. So her eyes were removed when she was alive and continued to live after Mm -hmm. their removal. Yep. Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. No, it was determined. It's terrible. It was determined that there were over 150 separate injuries on her body, including, and this is part of what I was, I didn't know if I should leave in, but I did. 
including burns on her thighs caused by the application of a hot iron, like a hot, you know, iron for clothes, Mm -hmm. stab wounds inside her mouth as well as all over her body that were caused by forks, scissors, knives, and pruning shears. Both hands were crushed. The bones in both her hands had been crushed, like her hands were broken. Mm -hmm. Both of her kneecaps had been shattered. Mutilation of the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, genitalia, and partial scalping. And there was a few more injuries, but I just put those in there. I thought that would Gruesome suffice. Enough. Yeah. Unreal. It was believed that, that poor baby. it was, be- I just don't understand. Like, mm-hmm. I don't understand what somebody, I, I mean, this is more than just violent. He's insane. He is a insane, sadist, you know? Yeah. Sadist. It was believed that Kellyanne endured torture for at least four weeks with the cause of death being at the end, it was drowning. It was determined by authorities that the crime happened like this, or this is how they think it happened. She was in the bathtub. After James knocked Kellyanne in the head with a shower nozzle, he forced her head underwater, causing her to drown. During the last month of her life, she had been kept bound, sometimes tied by her hair, sometimes by other ligatures, to a radiator or a piece of furniture by her neck, and that ended up causing her to be partially scalped. I'm sure the poor thing was trying to get away. I would think so. I would hope so. Terrible. Her poor parents, too. It's awful. Could you imagine having to live with that, knowing that that's what your child... No. Terrible. Poor, Poor people. The case went to trial, during which the prosecutors went into great detail about the torture that Kellyanne had endured. Prosecutor Peter Openshaw said... It was as if he deliberately disfigured her, causing her the utmost pain, distress, and degradation. The injuries were not the result of one sudden eruption of violence. They must have been caused over a long period and were so extensive and so terrible that the defendant must have deliberately and systematically tortured the girl. Her death must have been a merciful end to her torment. That about made me cry. Because it's true. That poor girl, mm. she just I'm sure she just wanted to die at that point, right? Oh, you would think so. Given up hope. During the trial, two other women would come forward to testify to the abuse that they had suffered while dating Smith. And they had said that he had used violence to control them as well as others. Now, these two weren't named, not that I could find, but I'm pretty sure they're the two that he dated earlier, right, mm-hmm. that we talked about. Right. A court psychiatrist named Jillian Menzi diagnosed Smith, claiming he had a severe paranoid disorder with morbid jealousy and that he lived in a distorted reality. (laughs) You think? think? (laughs) Just a bit. (laughs) Now, here's the doozy. Like, if this isn't all bad enough, because it is. But Smith argued that he was the real victim, Jen. He's the victim. He claimed that Kellyanne Bates drove him to kill her by taunting him and even argued that she inflicted some of the injuries herself to make him look bad. What? Yes. You heard. (laughs) I was waiting for you to respond. Yeah. No. Huh. But did he expect people to believe that? Yeah. I think so. He's, yeah, I think so. But thank God nobody would believe that heinous lie. It didn't take very long for the jury to come up with what they thought he deserved. In fact, it was just under an hour. They found the then 49-year-old James Patterson Smith guilty of murdering Kellyanne Bates. On November 19, 1997, he was sentenced to life in prison. The judge, Justice Sachs, recommended that Smith serve a minimum term of 20 years and stated, This has been a terrible case, a catalog of depravity by one human being upon another. You are a highly dangerous person. You are an abuser of women, and I intend, so far as it is in my power, that you will abuse no more. Good. And just a little, I guess, end note, little footnote, if you will. The trial photo, and I mean, frankly, the graphic nature of all of the details, left the jury in distress, stressed, and obviously traumatized. I mean, they had to witness this and see all this graphic stuff that nobody should ever have to see. So the Manchester Crown Court 
offered professional counseling services to the jurors. And for the first and only time in the history, up until this point, all of them accepted and went to professional psychiatric counseling. They would almost have to. Again, she was a kid, 17. Yeah. It's terrible. She's, yeah. That's horrible. So that, Jen, is the first night. Merry Christmas! Uh, yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. It's, it's kind of morbid that we do this, honestly. But It is, and the fact that my, at the time, 12-year-old thought of it is really disturbing. And I worry about yeah. her sometimes, but then again, no, I don't. she is... I think she's awesome. She is my daughter, so what can you do? So that's that, Jen. That that's is the first, first night. nightmare. Well, thank you that very much. It. So we will totally see gruesome. you guys... All tomorrow. tomorrow, when Jen has day number two, two. deuce, deuce, two, two, it, two. It should be a little bit lighter than number one, but yeah, it just depends. Well, we'll see. It's still murder, all right. and it's still disgusting, it but it's a little bit lighter. It's a little bit meringue. Can murder be light? Let, let's be honest. Can it be light? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. I, I mean, maybe there's layers to the darkness. Let's go that way instead. Never light, just layers, layers to, the darkness. to the darkness. True. Or it's just right? enough time has passed between then and now. Yeah. So. All but right. honestly, some, sometimes criminals, they're idiots. And they, oh, they, they are. Fun of. They Not do. the victims. Never the victims. But the criminals, heck to the yeah. Yep. Idiots. All righty, guys. All right, we'll Jen. see you tomorrow. And remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at artruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all Our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Mm-hmm.